In this video, I'll be comparing the English Standard Version with the Revised Standard Version. I'll focus mostly on the New Testament, and I'll propose a conspiracy theory that the fact that the English Standard Version is so well favored in the Reformed community is because it's actually deliberately biased in favor of Reformed or Calvinistic theology. The conspiracy theory uh, may have some legs because several prominent Reformed personalities have endorsed the English Standard Version. John Piper, Albert Moeller, R.C. Sproul, and Philip Ryken. Here's my outline. We'll talk about the general character of the English Standard Version, and then I'll focus in on the thesis by looking at several Calvinistic proof texts and comparing the Revised Standard Version translation with the English Standard Version. We'll look at how the English Standard Version modified those Revised Standard Version texts. We'll look then to see if there's any evidence of modifications to the translation to support peculiar Reformed views. I'm not going to talk about the first sub-bullet under the first bullet in any detail later on, so let me just say here that the English Standard Version does rely more heavily on the Masoretic Old Testament. If you go back and read the preface to the Revised Standard Version, you'll see that they say, the present revision, I'm quoting now, is based on the consonantal Hebrew and Aramaic text as fixed in the Christian era and revised by Jewish scholars, the Masoretes of the 6th to 9th centuries, the vowel signs, which were added by the Masoretes, are accepted in the main, but where a more probable and convincing reading can be obtained by assuming different vowels, this has been done. They go on to say, departures from the consonantal text of the best manuscripts have been made only where it seems clear that errors in copying have been made before the text was standardized. Most of the corrections adopted are based on the ancient versions translated into Greek, Aramaic, Syriac, and Latin. So the Revised Standard Version does, in fact, rely upon the other ancient texts other than the Hebrew text, where it feels it has the need to do so. If you read the English Standard Version preface, on the other hand, it says, the English Standard Version is based on the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible. And it gives the sources for the Hebrew and the Greek. And then it says, The currently renewed respect among Old Testament scholars for the Masoretic text is reflected in the ESV's attempt, wherever possible, to translate difficult Hebrew passages as they stand in the Masoretic text, rather than resorting to emendations or to finding an alternate reading in the ancient versions. So that's one clear philosophical difference between the two translations. And again, we will not focus on that in this video. Thomas Nelson gave up the copyright to the American Standard Version in 1928. They gave it to the International Council of Religious Education, who then performed a study to determine whether they thought it was appropriate to revise the American Standard Version. They decided in favor of doing it and began the translation in 1938. The Revised Standard Version's New Testament came out in 1946, and the Old Testament was published in 1952. From that time until the appearance of the New Revised Standard Version in about 1990, the Revised Standard Version was the preferred translation of liberal Protestants. However, it wasn't well accepted amongst fundamentalists or conservative evangelicals. In his book, A User's Guide to Bible Translations, David Dewey writes, This was the era of communist witch hunts, and some even suggested that the Revised Standard Version had been inspired by, quote, Reds under the beds, unquote. A warning appeared in the 1960s U.S. Air Force training manual specifically cautioning recruits against the communist-tainted Revised Standard Version. One copy of the Revised Standard Version was burned and then sent to the Translation Committee 
I think that it kick-started the King James-only movement. We're here now at our first chart, and we'll take a look at some of the modifications to those notorious Revised Standard Version passages, the ones that raised everyone's ire. The first one you uh, see there is Genesis 22:18, where the Revised Standard Version had, By your descendants shall all the nations of the earth bless themselves. The English Standard Version now has made that less offensive and more in keeping with the, tr the traditional understanding by replacing descendants with offspring. Descendants is clearly plural, while offspring could be singular or plural, and the singular ending understanding is more in keeping with Paul's message in Galatians 3. The blessed themselves really takes away from the notion that it is Christ that is the blessing. So the next passage is Psalm 1610, and I think it's pretty obvious what upset people here, because the the traditional understandings read more like what you see in the English Standard Version on the right. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol. If you read as the Revised Standard Version does on the left, Thou dost not give me up to Sheol. That would kind of imply that the Mohammedan Islamic heresy is correct and that Jesus did not die. He never went to hell. Whereas the English Standard Version fixes that and makes it clear that he's not left in hell. The last one is the most famous one of all. I think this is the one that created the most consternation with the Revised Standard Version. And yet, it's interesting, the Revised Standard Version tends to go back to the Septuagint as sometimes superior to the Masoretic text. And the Septuagint reading here is... Here in Isaiah 7.14 is the virgin, but here the Revised Standard Version has gone back to the Masoretic text. And I don't know Hebrew, but I understand that the word Alma is what's being translated here. And it does mean young woman. The young woman, in all likelihood, in that context, was in fact a virgin. So the translation virgin seems to me at least to be perfectly acceptable. But there you have it. The English Standard Version repaired the Revised Standard Version's offense by going back to the, to the traditional reading, the Virgin. I only show two passages here, but there are four. Two are mentioned. And in the little box with a white background at the bottom, they're all of one piece. Uh, the issue has to do with the Revised Standard Version's replacement of the word that had been traditionally translated by propitiation with expiation. The Greek word is hilasterion. And the question here is, what's the right translation? Why is this controversial? John Murray, in his Redemption Accomplished and Applied, gives a clue to it. He says, Propitiation presupposes the wrath and displeasure of God, and the purpose of propitiation is the removal of this displeasure. Very simply stated, the doctrine of propitiation means that Christ propitiated the wrath of God and rendered God propitious to his people. Continuing the quotation, Perhaps no tenant respecting the atonement has been more violently criticized than this one. It has been assailed as involving the mythical, myth, uh, myth, mythological conception of God as supposing internal conflict in the mind of God and between the persons of the Godhead. It has been charged that this doctrine represents the Son as winning over the incensed Father to clemency and love a supposition wholly inconsistent with the fact that the love of God is the very font from which the atonement springs." Close quote. So that, I think, may have caused the offense. When the Revised Standard Version changed propitiation to expiation, I think it may have been 
in the time when that controversy was raging and the translators appeared to be taking sides, that this notion that God can be wrath, wrathful and can be appeased was being removed from the translation in favor of the side that opposed the notion of propitiation. So in all four cases, the English Standard Version has returned to, to the traditional translation. What I've done in these charts is to try to show the important differences in blue or red and alternate those and the ones that are not very significant in purple. So here you see Psalm 2.7 where sun is not capitalized in the Revised Standard Version, taking that as not referring to deity. The English Standard Version restores the traditional understanding that that is a reference there to Christ, the Son of God, a member of the Divine Godhead, the Holy Trinity. Psalm 2, 11 through 12. This is one of those places where the Revised Standard Version believes that the Hebrew is obscure, so they have conjectured that what was really meant there was kiss his feet. And the English Standard Version has restored the traditional understanding, uh, the tra traditional translation of kiss the son. The Psalm 45.6 issue is pretty clear. The traditional address there is to God. Your throne, O God. Whereas the Revised Standard Version says, it says that the throne itself is divine. God may have given it, it may be from God, so Psalm 45, 6 in the Revised Standard Version is not actually addressing a person as God. And then Romans 9, 5, it's pretty clear here that the issue is one, uh, it's one of whether Christ is deity. The Revised Standard Version has translated things so that um, what you have at the end is a doxology to God that does not make reference to Christ. It's disconnected from Christ, while the English Standard Version happily has translated that so that Christ is understood as God. God over all, blessed forever. So I'm just reminding you of where we are here in the outline. We're still in the first major bullet, and we're moving now to the third sub-bullet. We're going to look at two particular passages and try to show the general character of changes that were made in the New Testament. That's before we head into the conspiracy theory and determine whether the translators are trying to deliberately alter the translation to support their Calvinistic notions. Luke 12.47 and 40, and 12.48 will have separate uh, chart, a separate chart on the 12.48 issue in just a moment. But here we'll look at some of the changes made. The Revised Standard Version's Make Ready is replaced by Get Ready, and I think that simply, they're trying to use more modern English there. I call that NIV and the they want to try to make it as easy to read as possible and try to grab some of the, the cash from people who like to buy the NIV. The second change is a shall to will. I was taught English in grade school by little old ladies, uh, some of whom were born before World War I, and they thought the shall will distinction was pretty important, uh, but we no longer do. The third issue is one of changing a masculine pronoun, he, to the one, and in this case, um, in this case, I think that this may be a, a nod to gender neutrality because the expression there is masculine in the Greek, and I don't really see that there is any good reason for replacing the masculine sense of the Greek with the gender neutral, the one. But as I point out there, in the second half of 1248, they say him, 
so what was the point of the earlier replacement? Uh, then the passage continues in verse 48, and it says, uh, Everyone to whom much is given of him, much will be required. So we're talking about people who can be referred to with a masculine or masculine sounding pronoun. In the old days, him was used as a gender non-specific pronoun. It was dual use. I think my third grade teacher lectured us on about how she and her and hers were all specific to women and men couldn't use them, but men were obligated to share their pronouns, he, his, and him, share them with the women. Um, but that went out of common usage back uh, in the late 60s, early 70s time frame, I suppose. On my point here, the of, from change is probably not that significant. They correctly here in the red replaced men commit from the RSV with they entrusted because the word men is not there in the Greek. Also, the tense, I think, is probably better reflected. The Greek tense is better reflected in the English Standard Version than it, than it is in the Revised Standard Version. So in this case, where we've gotten rid of men is not a gender, uh, gender inclusiveness issue. It just makes sense. So the next example for the character of the change is a passage from Luke 15, 11 through 15. This is the parable of the prodigal son. And you can see the changes that I found between the Revised Standard Version and the English Standard Version. You can see that they aren't major, and clearly one set the pattern for the other. And in the next few charts, we'll go over each of the more significant ones. The English Standard Version replaces the Revised Standard Version's falls to with is coming. In my opinion, based on the Greek, the Revised Standard Version is more literal here. The change is coming to is probably made for readability again. It's that NIV and NV issue. Falls to is perfectly decent English and used to be widely understood. Whether we use living or property here, I think, is indifferent. The Greek could be translated either way, and probably the ESV change was made uh, in order to be more easily understood by the reading public. Continuing, we look at the question of whether loose or reckless is a better translation at this point. The Greek word means having no hope of safety, abandoned, profligate, profligate living. So I think both are perfectly acceptable. Which is better, great or severe? The Revised Standard Version has a great famine. The English Standard Version has a severe famine. Both are perfectly acceptable. Again, it's a wash. Finally, did the son go and join himself to one of the citizens of the country, or did he go and hire himself out to one of the citizens? Joined is better, very literal, and that's exactly what the Greek word means, but hired himself out is probably what is meant. So if you want to be well understood, you go with hired himself out. The more literal reading would be joined. I believe what the New American Standard Version does is uh, to put hired himself out in the text and joined in the textual note, the translation note uh, that they put in their side column that starts with the letters L-I-T period. So I, I hope what you got out of those two passages is what I do as well. That in general, the English Standard Version is making changes for readability and that there is no great difference in terms of whether one of them is more literal than the other. There doesn't seem to be any great superiority of one over the other. So, so now we'll move on to the key part of the video, which is this question of whether there's a conspiracy to modify the Revised Standard Version in order to support Calvinism.
John 6.44 is one of the favorite Calvinist proof texts. And as you can see, the English Standard Version here has only made a punctuation change. Unless deleting semicolons biases a translation toward Calvinism, it looks pretty innocuous to me. John 10.26 says, You're not among my sheep, and that's the reason you don't believe. It doesn't say, You're not among my not among my sheep because you don't believe. But there's no difference here between the Revised Standard Version and the English Standard Version in terms of the meaning. I was taught that you always put a comma before a phrase that begins with because, but the English language changes. I would say that this is a neutral change. Acts 13.48 As many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and no others, only those who were ordained or appointed to eternal life, the others continue to disbelieve. I don't see a difference here. Someone else may, but ordained and appointed have the same effect. Perhaps the change was made because the English Standard Version wanted to make sure that no one was understanding this in some kind of a clerical sense, uh, but I don't see that either. Maybe they had some kind of a sacerdotal concern. But that really doesn't make any sense in the context. I think perhaps it's NIV, NV again. Ordained is too hard. Appointed is much easier. All right, um, now we're in Romans 8, 29 through 30, the great chain of the Ordo Salutis in Reformed theology. There are minor changes here in punctuation. The ESV continues to persecute uh, semicolons, and it has exchanged brethren for brothers. I don't grasp how brethren is hard to understand, but I think that must be the explanation for that change. No other changes here. Here's the passage about Jacob and Esau from Romans 9:11 through 13. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. That portion is translated exactly the same. Not because of works, God's purpose of election, all that's the same. The only differences are his call becomes him who calls, and the English Standard Version is more literal there. It's a more literal translation. Then they replace elder with older. I prefer elder. This is one of the reasons I have difficulty bringing myself to use the English Standard Version. I like so many things about what the Revised Standard Version had done and retained, but I don't see a pro-Calvinist bias here. Next is Romans 9, 22 through 24, the famous Vessels of Wrath passage. The English Standard Version gets rid of the word the before Vessels of Wrath. And that's correct. It's a reasonable change because the Greek doesn't include the article there. Is made better than prepared or prepared better than made? I think it's a wash, and I'm not sure why the change was made. It appears to me, and I've noticed this in several places, the English Standard Version really likes these dashes. Uh, the commas seem to work well enough. But let them use dashes if they please. The passage in Second Corinthians four three through four, where it talks about how the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they can't believe the gospel. The passages are identical except for one word, which the Revised Standard Version translated as likeness, and the English Standard Version translated as image. It's the word that we get our English word icon from, and image and likeness are perfectly acceptable translations. Ephesians 1, 4, 11, and 12 I've shown here. This is a confusing mess, and the reason it is is because the Revised Standard Version really has taken liberties here. It's a very tree, uh, free translation right at the spot. In the next passage, you'll see from Ephesians, they've also taken a bit of a liberty.
a bit of a liberty with the text, but not this badly. Uh, but you can see most of the elements that were in the Revised Standard Version are also in the English Standard Version. The English Standard Version really follows the order of the Greek better. Are there any significant changes there that would indicate that the English Standard Version translators are trying to insert a pro-reformed, pro-Calvinistic bias in the text? I don't think so, unless you think the American Standard Version was biased towards Calvinism as well. This all looks innocuous to me. So here you have a number of minor changes in Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. The only major change is that the Revised Standard Version repeats the fact that God made those people who were dead in trespasses and sins alive. It does it by supplying a verb in verse 1, which isn't there in the Greek. But it repeats or anticipates the verb that appears later at the end of the passage. at the end of the passage where it says, God made us alive together with Christ. So in my view, the Revised Standard Version is re more reformed here than the English Standard Version, at least in this passage, because you see the fact that God is making us alive. We're not making ourselves alive, but God's doing that work, and you see it repeated. The other changes are small. N becomes through, these become whom, little farther down, the following becomes carrying out. You get the article inserted before body, an article before mind. God who is becomes God being. That's the rich in mercy part there. God who is rich in mercy, out of the great love becomes because of the great love. Through changes to in, and the punctuation of the phrase by grace you have been saved is changed from parentheses to the English Standard Version's preferred dashes. But really I don't see any doctrinal bias in those changes except that the ESV takes out one of the statements that it is God, one of the statements that it is God who made you alive. So here we are in the summary. Uh, no, I didn't actually expect to see any evidence of a conspiracy that the ESV translators were trying to bias the translation in favor of Reformed theology. But who knows, I had to take a look just to make sure, and I don't see any such bias. I just see a mild to moderate revision of the Revised Standard Version. It's so moderate that the ESV could easily be termed the Revised Standard Version, the 2016 edition, there's no real reason for a change in the name. Perhaps legally there is, but for a reader it's essentially the same translation updated. The 2016 ESV could easily be called the, 2000 and, uh, the Revised Standard Version Evangelical Edition, Fourth Evangelical Edition. The changes uh, generally make the translation more literal. I say generally, but not always. Sometimes the Revised Standard Version was more literal. I think the ESV editors make, it, make the translation more modern. And the notion is to try to make it more popular, to try to eat into some of those NIV sales. As I mentioned, there's no pro-reformed bias in the translation, at least from what I've looked at. Now, maybe in some of the other places, apart from the typical Calvinist proof texts, some of the texts that haven't historically been Calvinistic in sense were changed to become Calvinist. I didn't look at that, and maybe someone will. All these changes that are in the Reform proof texts seem to be all of the same type as the other changes. The final bullet you see there is, uh, this is a very interesting historical question to me, and my background for it. David Dewey, in his book that I mentioned earlier, A User's Guide to Bible Translations, um, he, point, he explains this history very well. So I'm going to quote him for a few pages on uh, 
page 146 he says, while some evangelicals dismissed the Revised Standard Version out of hand, others saw potential in it. Luther Weigel, chairman of the Revised Standard Version Committee, was approached more than once about the possibility of producing an edition of the Revised Standard Version more acceptable to conservatives. This was refused. The appearance of the Catholic edition rubbed salt in evangelical wounds and stiffened suspicions of the Revised Standard Version in opposition to it still further. Then on page 153, he gives us the date. He says, as early as 1953, two separate, that's the year the Old Testament was translated, as early as 1953, two separate inquiries about publishing an evangelical edition of the Revised Standard Version were declined. And then he goes on later on the same page. Uh, in a two-hour meeting in 1966 with the Luther Weigel, chairman of the Revised Standard Version Committee, the option of preparing an evangelical edition of the Revised Standard Version was refused, despite the appearance of a Catholic edition in the same year. So clearly, the Revised Standard Version Committee had issues with evangelicals. This was all part of that modernist, Calvin, uh, modernist conservative war that J. Gresham Makem wrote about so many years ago. So perhaps if we had had that Revised Standard Version Evangelical Edition published in the 1960 time frame. Perhaps we never would have had a new international version. I'm not so sure that would have been a bad thing, but that's just my opinion. I hope you enjoyed this video. It's not a typical Bible review, but I thought I would branch out and try something different.